Uh, welcome everybody. It's, um, I'm Stephanie White in the Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology, and um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Michael Brecht, coming to us from Berlin. I uh, got to know Michael as part of um, the Neural Systems and Behavior course that's taught every summer, except for this past summer at the Marine Biological Labs in Woods Hole. And so even though it's noon for us here and it's nine there, and you might think that um, he's getting tired, I have seen him at the rig after midnight, personally teaching students how to patch clamp in um, rat uh, cortex, somatosensory cortex. So there's really nobody quite like Michael in terms of um, who he is and um, what he does. He's an expert in the anatomy of the mammalian cerebral cortex in terms of its functional organization and um, interesting things like uh, the biological basis of play and fun. He takes a comparative approach, which is dear to my heart in using different species, depending on the question that he's interested in. Uh, he has an innovative vision of what, of what science is and can be. Um, he got his start in uh, Tübingen doing his di diploma with um, Prylowski and also I heard a uh, half or a quarter year at UCSF with Michael Mertzenich. Um, and that's where he began his studies on rat barrel cortex that he continues today. And he did his PhD with Wolf Singer at the Max Planck Frankfurt on uh, synchronism in cat superior colliculus, and then moved to the Max Planck Heidelberg where he was a group leader under Bert Sackman. And there he was really an innovator in applying intracellular, intracellular recording techniques and did some of the first uh, whole cell patch clamping in um, rat cortex on rat hippocampus of freely behaving animals. Um, and then he moved to his own lab and group um, in Rotterdam and now where he is today in Berlin at um, Humboldt University and the Bernstein uh, Center for Computational Neuroscience. Um, so he's made fundamental discoveries that uh, come before his time, such as showing that stimulation of even a single neuron can be uh, read out in the behavior that the animal shows you that it perceives that. Um, and he's got very wide ranging interests that I think you can already tell that we're in for a treat from his slides, uh, from this slide, ranging from grid cell organization, the dynamics of social touch and behavior, hormonal modulations, interactions between males and females, organization of body maps, evolution of play. He's just so creative. Um, and fascinating, and I'm not really even sure what he's going to talk about. I wasn't until I saw this slide. So um, please go ahead and interrupt him if you have a question. He's welcoming of that, and uh, please go ahead, Michael. Hey, thanks, Steph. It's a big honor to uh, give a lecture at UCLA, uh, and uh, I, of course, would prefer much rather prefer to be there in person, uh, but uh, such is life in the days of COVID. Uh, so uh, we try to make the best from it. And what I want to talk about is uh, blood is thicker than water. And this is a quote from an old uh, Heidelberg manuscript, more than a thousand years old. And uh, uh, already there, it referred to the idea that uh, sort of bonds uh, based on kinship, ba based on genetics are, are, are sort of stronger than other affiliations, yeah? Uh, blood at this time, it was a proxy for DNA. They didn't know it, yeah? Uh, so, uh, uh, and what I'll talk about in detail, uh, there are three parts to the talk. I first give a brief intro about uh, kinship and uh, social neuroscience. I will then um, discuss how kinship behaviors is mediated in rats uh, by the lateral septum. And uh, in the last part of the talk, uh, which uh, gives us this uh, more bloody spin, uh, I'll talk about uh, kinship and uh, the strange neurobiology of cannibalism. Yeah? Uh, it's, uh, this is uh, in an intriguing way intertwined with uh, uh, both the lateral septum and cannibalism. And uh, we'll see uh, what you get out of it. Uh, let me introduce uh, the uh, main topic, uh, sort of social neuroscience. Uh, social neuroscience, it's not that it's not done a lot. There is tons of studies in social neuroscience, but 
uh, very often uh, they are more psychological than biological. And again, there is uh, nothing wrong with it, uh, uh, sort of studying empathy or so. What is wrong, uh, there's nothing wrong with psychological studies. What is wrong is that we, that we have so little biologically oriented work on, on social interactions. And uh, I think that that's a shame. So a lot of this stuff is uh, imaging oriented. It's not very circuit wise. And often uh, a lot of the social neuroscience stuff is also a bit soft, yeah? The last uh, problem that I see in that field is it's very uh, strongly uh, disease oriented. And uh, there is nothing wrong with it again, uh, but uh, what is wrong is that we study the normal behavior so little. Like at SFN, the most common um, uh, keyword is autism. And there are about 5,000 uh, uh, posters on uh, last SFN two years ago, about 5,000 posters on autism. And uh, this is all good and well, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced we should try to fix autism. What is wrong is that there's so little attention paid to the normal social behavior, yeah? like kinship, uh, uh, sort of family bonds. Very little work is done on this. There were four posters uh, uh, on kinship and, and 5,000 on autism. And, uh, you should, uh, you should not, uh, the funding agencies, let you run into that mistake. Uh, your family is as important as autism. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's, uh, I think we need more biologically oriented work. And uh, obviously maybe the greatest paper um, on the evolution of social behavior uh, since Darwin came from Hamilton and he thought about the problem in a, a very biological way. And he came up with uh, this skin selection idea. And he thought about how could um, altruistic behaviors, how could they arise? And he uh, formulated this rule uh, that you should engage in an act if uh, the cost is smaller than the benefit uh, uh, to the recipient, times the relatedness of the uh, uh, recipient. Namely, he asks how much, uh, he, he, he suggested that by inclusive fitness, you should engage in behaviors uh, that benefit related uh, subjects. And that's then where all this um, inclusive fitness idea came about. And this idea was very successful in explaining insect societies. And actually it really rocked behavioral biology but it had relatively little impact up to date on uh, uh, systems neuroscience, yeah? Uh, kinship has been a non-topic in, or a, a relatively neglected topic. And uh, let me further drive this point home, yeah? So uh, why does kinship matter? Here I do something uh, that you absolutely should never do. And what I do here is I show my family and uh, this is a total no-go. You should never show pictures of your family in a talk. And the reason is nobody gives a shit. So I get this heartwarming feeling when I stare at my family and none of you could care less, yeah? And this is what I wanna talk about today. Uh, there's a big difference between my brain and your brain when it comes to my family, yeah? And uh, this is something that everybody has and uh, uh, it's something we, we try to understand today. Now, these preferences, uh, uh, these uh, bonds in the family, they are kind of obvious uh, in, in the private domain. They are even more uh, striking when they sort of invade the public domain. And who, who made this famous are uh, really the popes, yeah? And what they did is they often, uh, made their children or nephews uh, uh, cardinals, yeah? So the Pope made uh, his nephews cardinals and uh, it freaked people out, yeah? You had 10 year old cardinals, yeah? Because just because they were uh, a nephew of the Pope and uh, the Italians came up with this word for it, a nepotism from nepotismo for, for nephew, yeah? And uh, uh, then, uh, because it freaked people so much out, uh, they made laws against it. Like the Vatican uh, made a law that uh, you could only make one nephew or one son or one brother a cardinal. Yeah, uh, that was the first law. And since then, uh, basically all the governments or most of the governments uh, made laws against nepotism such that your uh, family preferences don't override uh, uh, 
uh, achievement and qualification in the public domain. But um, if you look to Washington, it's still difficult to get rid of, um, yeah, it's still, it's very difficult to get uh, rid of these family preferences, even in the highest places up to date. Now, uh, the Pope's made it famous. What I find even more freaky and uh, almost uh, hard to believe is uh, uh, you, you don't just see that in people, you see that even in uh, animal, in organisms that don't have a brain, like uh, plants, yeah? If you put two flowering plants together and you put two siblings together, they, they grow one set of fruits. Uh, and then if you replace the sibling with a stranger, the, the plants, they start to compete harder, yeah? If you put a stranger in there, uh, 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 they grow more roots, they compete harder with each other. So what that makes uh, uh, me think is that uh, this kinship behavior is maybe a social behavior that is older than the brain, yeah? It's, it's, um, it, I find it very hard to believe that you have that in the plants, but there are several such studies. They are also quite convincing uh, kinship behaviors shown in single cell animals. And all of that makes you think that uh, Hamilton had a good intuition that kinship really matters for behavior. And uh, uh, we had we used to have very little idea uh, how this is organized in the brain. And uh, this is the topic that uh, Anne Clements, a postdoc in my lab, addressed. Yeah. And she studied uh, the rat, the rat lateral septum and kinship behavior. And uh, it's sort of the second part of the talk. Uh, the lateral septum, it's not been uh, uh, a favorite structure of neuroscience. Uh, people, most people said it medial septum. It's in the middle of the rat brain here. Um, uh, what's it like? It's, if you wish so, it's a, it's, it receives lots of input from the hippocampus. It's a kind of a striatum for the hippocampus, yeah? Uh, uh, so uh, there's tons of input, in particular from ventral hippocampus. There's also inputs from the medial amygdala uh, 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 quite a bit. Uh, remember the medial amygdala gets a lot of hormonal or input uh, that carries information about uh, 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 social smells and stuff. It, uh, these are two very prominent inputs. There are other inputs too. It makes also lots of outputs. Um, uh, let me just mention two outputs of uh, these neurons in the lateral septum. One goes to the PHE and uh, actually the, the periodical gray in the midbrain. And um, there, this input, we know uh, it comes from the deep layers of the lateral septum. and. Uh, it uh, inhibits sexual behaviors. Maybe I briefly touch upon it. Another one uh, goes uh, to the lateral hypothalamus where uh, a lot of the cells are uh, should be eaten if they are palatable. Uh, uh, this is an important input. Uh, for the final part, uh, output uh, for the final part of the talk. So what made us go into the um, uh, lateral septum and study kinship there? So I was fortunate enough to talk to Jorge Moll who did a human imaging study. They saw uh, where he evoked family memories specifically uh, in a quite controlled way. And he saw a couple of reasons light up. One of them was uh, the uh, septum. From reading the paper, I wouldn't have seen it, but I, I talked at length to him and he was quite convinced there was a specific signal uh, uh, somewhere in the anterior th uh, thalamus or, or the septum uh, that related, that was evoked when you were talking about your family. And this was a very important um, uh, first indication for us. So now um, we decided to study kinship behavior and we did this in rats. And uh, uh, what we then used is we used um, work that was done earlier by Peter Hepper. And he was one of these many behavioral biologists who were inspired by Hamilton to look at kinship. Before Hamilton, Biologists didn't even know if, uh, if uh, animals knew their kin, yeah? if they had a sense of family. 
And Hepper was one of these following uh, the, the, the theory paper, uh, the, kin, the kin selection paper, and he studied kinship behavior in rats. And uh, he did this in uh, uh, little rats and, and he had two, um, he, he built an apparatus that we rebuilt and that worked quite well. The details of the apparatus matter. Uh, I don't elaborate on them. You have uh, one family sitting here, one family sitting here, and then you put a pup that can either go to the own family or to the uh, strangers, yeah? You put a pup in the middle there. And what he showed is that young red pups, yeah, uh, sort of up to uh, maybe 15 days of age, they preferentially go to their own family, yeah? They crawl to their family. Uh, now, very interestingly, when the rats get older, uh, 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 in particular when they're older than uh, P16, uh, what they do is they systematically run away from their own family. Yeah, uh, they systematically do not go to their family, but they go to the strangers. And what that tells you is that already in rats, you know, family is a complicated thing. Yeah, you know, uh, it's you think you love them, but uh, but they sure also uh, have uh, 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 age ranges where they run away from them. Now we reproduced this behavior, and we found exactly the same. Those are our data. Uh, uh, just maybe focus on the blue trace. It's the same than the HEPA trace. Uh, when they're young, they go 60, 70% to their family. When they're older, they uh, avoid their family. They go 80% to the strangers. Yeah? And these uh, behaviors uh, are night and day different. Uh, um, uh, it's a one in 10,000 thing different uh, in young and old animals. So how does this come about? Uh, what we did then is, we first did lesions uh, in, um, in young animals. Remember the young animals, when the rats are young, uh, they, they go to their family and we removed uh, uh, the, the lateral septum. And uh, uh, after we removed the, uh, the lateral septum, the animals go by chance. Yeah, the, the, con the intact animals, they go 70% to their family and uh, the uh, lesion animals, uh, uh, they don't behave differently from chance and they behave very differently from the uh, intact animals. Uh, okay, so young animals need the lateral septum to go to their family. What about older animals? Uh, uh, same thing. And there we did two types of lesions. We first uh, did, uh, again, a lesion of the lateral septum. We also did a control lesion uh, where we just lesioned the overlying uh, cortex. Now, what do we find? Intact animals go, uh, when they are older, they avoid their own family. They go about 70% uh, to strangers. When we remove the lateral septum, they go by chance, exactly 50-50 in this case. Uh, when we do a control lesion, where the uh, lateral septum stays intact, but just the overlying cortex is lesioned, uh, the behavior is intact. They uh, uh, go 70% to uh, the uh, strangers. So both in young and in old animals, uh, the uh, rats need their lateral septum and it's a small part of the brain. We removed on average, we thought about 0.2% uh, of the brain mass. Uh, uh, relatively, it's not even a complete lesion of the lateral septum that you needed uh, to get rid of the behavior. Uh, Michael, there were other yeah. Michael, you might have said this, but um, is this male-female mixed? Uh, this is uh, pretty much similar in uh, females. The behavior of the older animals, um, the stranger prefer preference of the older animals, it's slightly clearer in the females. Um, and it's something that makes us think maybe this already has something to do with sexual attractions to stranger, uh, but we, we haven't checked this. So. In the uh, young animals, there was no uh, uh, gender difference. In the older animals, uh, I think both males and females show the stranger preference, but it's a bit uh, clearer, uh, uh, was a bit clearer in our hands in the females, yeah? Um, Thank you. There were also other behaviors that made us think uh, that we might be on the right track. And uh, for example, the animals with the lateral septum lesion 
uh, they often behaved a bit uh, weird. Uh, like here, you see the family, uh, all the siblings, they huddle together. This is the guy with the lesion, yeah? They were sort of socially weird here. Again, the guy with the lesion. We, we didn't study that all that systematically, but um, uh, there were other indications uh, um, that align with uh, other work from uh, earlier investigators that uh, these lesions have social effects. We then went into the brain and we looked uh, for um, the physiological underpinnings of these effects. And what we did is we would uh, present either siblings or mothers or non-siblings or non-mothers uh, to a, a head fixed animal, either anesthetized or vague. The results were pretty much uh, the same. Occasionally, we found uh, cells like this one uh, that, for example, responded uh, much, much more strongly than uh, to siblings than to non-siblings. But I have to say, these were cells, uh, that was the cells we initially were looking for, uh, but uh, they're relatively rare, yeah. Uh, um, what is more typical is you would have a, a stronger response to one, but uh, the difference was not all that big, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, that's why we uh, looked at additional things. Now, one additional observation that we made that we that I think uh, is very very interesting relates to the development of the animals. Remember, the young animals have a very different uh, kinship behavior. They go to their family uh, as opposed to the old animals. So. When we looked in development, what we found is in young animals, you find way more cells that respond to the family than in older animals. Uh, the non-sibling uh, responses, they don't change much or, or, or they didn't change significantly over development. But what we find in, in very young animals, a large fraction of cells responds to uh, uh, kin stimuli. Uh, whereas uh, uh, this fraction is noticeably smaller in old animals. And we think uh, that this might uh, be something that contributes to uh, the, the differential behavior of the ages. What was also very interesting is when we look carefully at where are the cells uh, that uh, show responses to a kin uh, uh, stimuli, order stimuli, uh, or uh, to stranger stimuli. And uh, this is shown here, and it's a complicated uh, slide, but I uh, carefully take you through it. So here we have the outline of the lateral septum, and each dot is the cell that we recorded. The co colored dots are the cells that show significant responses. And now, uh, dorsally, what we would find, we would find a lot of uh, significant responses to non-mothers or non-sibling uh, 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 stimuli. Yeah, uh, we find this dorsally. And then deeper in the lateral septum, we would find a lot of responses to siblings or the mother. Yeah. Uh, and both for sibling versus non-sibling orders or mother versus non-mother orders, uh, we find a significant uh, depth difference, yeah? Uh, so what does it mean? It means that the neurons in the lateral septum, they are ordered according uh, to their, uh, uh, their response preferences. They are uh, ordered according to kinship, yeah? Uh, and in honor of the popes, uh, we call this organization nepotopy, yeah? Uh, sort of uh, down there in the, in the uh, deep layers, we have responses to kin, uh, and in the uh, superficial layers, uh, we find preferentially responses to orders. And because these parameters that order the organization of neurons, they are often uh, the ones that are most important in the structure. Uh, that's why we thought this is a very encouraging result. I also told you already, I have briefly alluded to that. From the deep lateral septum, there are outputs to the PHG that inhibit sexual behaviors, yeah? And one of the things we obviously wonder if uh, this is how uh, also 
uh, uh, our sexual attitudes uh, could uh, be shaped, yeah? uh, namely, uh, uh, for some reason, uh, uh, our closest relatives, yeah, mothers, sisters, they're sexually not attractive. Yeah? And we wonder if this is uh, sort of something that is uh, mediated by uh, the deep uh, lateral septum. Okay, cool. Uh, this is what I wanted to say about uh, the lateral septum as a mediator of uh, kinship behaviors. I now go into uh, the third and last part of the talk where I uh, uh, sort of want to discuss uh, this, uh, this uh, strange world of uh, the cannibalism and how it relates to kinship. And this is something... Because... Yeah. Can I interrupt briefly? So could this sure. be familiarity because the cortex is not fully developed? So have you checked if these results are a result of the amount of familiarity to uh, just random objects versus actually kinship to family? Uh, so uh, we think that probably kinship is something learned. So if you do behavioral tests, um, uh, what you find is that... Uh, uh, the animals can, um, uh, they can also, they can distinguish their real relatives uh, from uh, cross-fostered relatives, so they can learn it. But they can also differentiate uh, cross-fostered, uh, non-genetically related uh, animals uh, from strangers. So they seem to learn it. Uh, I, I, we, we think that uh, the way that uh, these kinship mechanisms comes about, come about in vertebrates. There's a lot of evidence that points to learned mechanisms. Yeah, um, and um, that's why I also think I think uh, uh, it's very clear. For example, for the sexual preferences, uh, this is something the kids that are around you when you're young they are sexually not attractive. Uh, and we know this from the kibbutz, yeah? In the kibbutz at this philosophy, uh, bringing all the kids together as one family. And it turns out these people, they see each other every day. Uh, they almost never have sex. They never marry, uh, even though they are not genetic relatives, yeah? So uh, in humans, what seems to be recognized as kin is whom you're brought up with. So uh, I don't think there is really, um, uh, uh, the, the thinking is not that there is a genetic label uh, that is being recognized, but uh, it's something that is learned. There are other animals, some worms, they have a, a genetic label of the family. Yeah, they have uh, specifically highly variable uh, 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 proteins and uh, they don't uh, uh, prey on uh, what uh, smells like family. They have a genetic label, but in us, probably it's a familiarity uh, of, uh, of uh, it. Um, it's how it comes about. But maybe we can discuss it uh, at the end. Um, let's go into uh, cannibalism. Uh, uh, first of all, maybe we start with the anthropology of cannibalism. And this is something that's an, uh, an unresolved uh, debate. Uh, and uh, kind of uh, interesting. Uh, for hundreds of years, people saw it, uh, and there were lots of reports about cannibalism. And then in end of the 70s, Bill Ahrens, he came up with a book, uh, The Man-Eating Myth. And he claimed, oh, it never happened. Yeah, uh, It's all made up. And uh, what he said is, uh, nobody's ever seen it. And uh, 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 it's all something that uh, the white man invented to uh, sort of uh, 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 make the uh, indigenous uh, populations uh, bad mouse them. And uh, yeah, he had this book, The Man Eating Myth, and it rocked the place. Uh, and why was it so successful? Uh, uh, first of all, there, it's absolutely true that there are a lot of rubbish accounts about cannibalism, where people make up stories that they've never seen. This is true. Uh, what is also the case is it's difficult to come up with, uh, uh, with, with, with strong evidence. Uh, with there, relatively, there is a limited amount of eyewitness report because typically it was a secretive behavior and it was also a behavior became totally eradicated when, uh, when uh, the Christian uh, missionaries and settlers came in. It was the first thing that uh, we got rid of, yeah, heavy-handed, yeah. Uh, 
Um, also, uh, I think people have these weird feelings about cannibalism and uh, all of this made it very difficult. Uh, now there were people, anthropologists that pushed back against this. And uh, what he said is, it's just not true what, uh, what Arons wrote. Uh, there are lots of um, eyewitness reports yeah, and very trustworthy, very similar eyewitness reports uh, that you just can't discuss away. And a lot of what Arons had wrote uh, um, uh, was just simply incorrect, yeah. Um, and uh, Shailens, Marshall Shailens, he then said, hey, this is a universal behavior. Uh, uh, he pointed out there's lots of eyewitness reports, for example, from Captain Cook's crew got eaten. It's pretty clear they found uh, uh, half uh, the remains of the sailor half eaten and all of that. Uh, so, but it turned out to be, um, uh, almost unresolvable thing in, in anthropology, a uh, very uh, frustrating and toxic debate. So now what we're gonna do is we take a biological look at it and then revisit the problem. And um, why is it interesting uh, to study animal cannibalism? Much like with human cannibalism, people also said, even good ethologists said, oh, it never happened. Uh, now, if you look closely, there's absolutely no doubt. A, a large fraction of species show some form of cannibalism. Why is it biologically interesting? Uh, it's because the cost is so high. Yeah? If you think of, um, of the Hamilton family yeah? uh, uh, formula, uh, uh, you could rewrite this for cannibalism. You should eat somebody uh, if, uh, the, uh, if you, what you get out of it is, uh, uh, is larger than the cost uh, for the person uh, uh, times the relatedness. Now, what is the interesting thing about cannibalism? The cost is so high, yeah? When you eat your neighbor, he will not reproduce, yeah? You have a 100% effect on his survival, yeah? Uh, so uh, this uh, makes it uh, so interesting. And we're gonna look now at some uh, intraspecific comparison where we compare cannibalistic animals uh, or subjects to non-cannibalistic subjects. And uh, we check uh, how that looks in the brain. The first uh, example I want to give is stickleback cannibalism. These are heavily cannibalistic animals. Yeah, the males take care of the nest, and uh, cannibalism is it's uh, it's uh, it's a major force uh, in these animals. Yeah, uh, it's such that uh, they usually have a elaborate sexual behavior. But in some of the lakes, the cannibalism becomes so strong that they sort of secretly have sex uh, uh, to avoid uh, being uh, the, the nest being uh, 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 raided by, by cannibals. Yeah? It's, it's a very prominent behavior, the cannibalism in these animals. It shows clear kin avoidance. Uh, they, they attack uh, uh, preferentially uh, um, nests of others, not their own. Um, an interesting behavior they have is when they would eat a, a, a little fish, uh, they would uh, often uh, spit it out again. Yeah, that's something that many cannibals show, and I'll talk about this more. The cannibalistic behavior is suppressed during brood care. Yeah, when they have their own little fish hatch, that's when they are not cannibalistic. Now, uh, Kent and Bell, they looked in the lateral septum using uh, immediate early gene expression patterns uh, at the activity of the lateral septum. And what they found is uh, in the fish analog, uh, the, the ventral uh, uh, pallium uh, uh, sort of uh, of the lateral septum, what they found is when the fish look after their own little fish, then cannibalism is suppressed. That's when the lateral septum seem to be upregulated. And uh, this is the first of several examples that I want to give you of uh, individuals that show changes in the lateral septum as a function of cannibalistic behavior. Another example that is very well worked out uh, is cannibalism in uh, polyphenetic tadpoles. What are polyphenetic tadpoles? These are uh, uh, Mexican spade foot toads. They can make a different uh, um, phenotypes uh, depending on food availability. When you feed the, uh, the tadpoles with big pieces of um, food, yeah, uh, with shrimp, 
they develop, uh, they get predatory and they develop um, uh, a predatory phenotype. Uh, if, if you don't give them this big shrimp, they turn out to be uh, normal tadpoles that feed on plankton. Now, these, these predatory tadpoles, they are heavily cannibalistic, yeah? Uh, uh, these carnivore morphs, yeah? Now, what is very interesting is the social behavior of the animals uh, changes. These small conventional tadpoles that care, uh, that normally don't feed on others, but if you give them a very small tadpole, they would also eat it. And they don't care much about family. Now, these, uh, these, can, these carnivore tadpoles, and these can be brothers and sisters, yeah, these can be siblings, they uh, uh, develop a strong kin avoidance, yeah? They avoid, they don't like to eat uh, relatives, yeah? And uh, uh, what they also do is much like the sticklebacks, uh, they, they sometimes would attack a, 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 a related tadpole, but then they don't swallow it, they spit it out, yeah? Uh, much like the fish, yeah? Uh, when they are cannibalistic, when they eat kin, they spit it out, yeah? Now, what is so interesting about these tadpoles is their brain. So here we have uh, an animal that cares, it shows strong kin avoidance, uh, tries not to prey on, uh, on relatives. These animals, they don't care in their feeding behavior. Now, how does the brain look like? Uh, the lateral septum, this, it's, it's this swelling here in the carnivores is relatively much larger, yeah? It's about the, the the brain is much larger, uh, so the absolute size is maybe uh, six times larger, the lateral septum, but the relative size is also bigger. It's twofold larger, uh, the lateral septum in these uh, uh, carnivores. Now, the idea that we have here from both of these animals is that the lateral septum, it is involved in uh, protecting uh, your kin, yeah, that it, uh, that it has some, anti-cannibalistic uh, uh, guidance that protects your kin. This is our thinking. Let's uh, look uh, at uh, uh, human cannibals. Uh, we looked at Marlies Ostland in the lab. She looked at uh, a catalog of human cannibals and it turns out uh, cannibalistic rhymes, uh, they are very well documented. Uh, here is a prominent uh, human ca cannibal from uh, New York, Albert Fish. Uh, uh, an interesting behavior that he did, he killed children, yeah? Uh, he claimed he killed up to 100 children. The police was sure uh, that he uh, killed and ate uh, eight children, yeah? Uh, he got uh, uh, convicted for eating three, yeah? They had uh, enough evidence for three. Now, one of the things he did, and it's very odd, is he kills his children, and then he said uh, he, he had to vomit when he ate them, yeah? It's very strange, you know, he risked his life uh, to kill these children. Still, when he eats them, he vomits. Uh, and uh, obviously, this reminds us of the tadpoles and the sticklebacks, who also spit out. Now, when you look oh, at many such cannibalistic murders, yeah, uh, homicides, uh, uh, we did that. What you find is very few of these cannibals killed kin. Yeah, only uh, we we estimated something between 500 and 1,000 victims. Only 16 uh, were relatives. Yeah, and this is much less uh, than uh, the normal uh, ki uh, kin rate uh, in homicide. Yeah, it's usually about. Uh, uh, between uh, eight and uh, twenty percent, yeah, uh, kin that we kill uh, across different countries. Uh, for these cannibals, it's uh, it's only a few. Yeah. Um, now, uh, interestingly, not just these cannibalistic murderers, but also other people who uh, ate. Uh, uh, out of um, uh, maybe uh, war uh, cannibalism or so when, when people had nothing to eat and they killed other humans to eat, uh, as it seems also be the case that they avoid kin. Uh, there's this famous uh, uh, plane crash uh, in uh, Uruguay uh, uh, and uh, these people also, they, they, um, they didn't eat, the last people that they ate uh, of the dead were their kin. 
Let me talk a bit more broadly about uh, primate uh, uh, cannibalism. Most primates show very little cannibalism. Yeah? Uh, they kill their infants occasionally, in infanticide is seen there, but typically uh, they don't eat, um, um, eat them. Yeah? Now, the, the exception are really chimps and humans. Yeah? For chimps, it's very clear uh, that they are, are cannibalistic. Yeah, there are many reports that chimpanzees kill other chimpanzees and eat them. Yeah, and uh, uh, why is that so? Uh, one big difference between uh, chimps, humans, and the rest of the primates is that uh, chimpanzees, much like us, they eat a lot more meat. Yeah, they're quite sophisticated hunters. Yeah, and uh, probably. Uh, when you develop these skills to, to hunt, uh, uh, the cannibalism becomes much more of an issue. Now, I already alluded to the fact that in anthropology, uh, it's a toxic debate. It's, a, it's an unresolved issue how much cannibalism there was. Now, maybe the tribe where we have the best and the clearest evidence for cannibalism uh, are the four from uh, Papua New Guinea. And you might know them. Uh, because they've been studied for this uh, disease that was uh, uh, Kuru, that was uh, transmitted by cannibalism. Yeah. So what the four did is they ate their dead, um, and uh, they also would uh, eat sometimes people who misbehaved, or they would kill uh, enemies and eat them. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's a tribe uh, for which we have the best evidence for cannibalism. Now, uh, something very interesting about the four uh, is uh, their lateral septum, yeah? uh, their septal nuclei. Uh, Beck and Gertjusek, they studied these brains originally to understand uh, these neurodegenerative uh, disease, scrapies, uh, uh, Kourou, uh, uh, Jakob Kreuzfeld disease. Yeah? And uh, what they noted is that the brains overall were small of the four because they are very small people, uh, but they looked totally the same in their hands, with the exception of the septal nuclei. Yeah? And the septal nuclei were in absolute terms, uh, maybe uh, three, four times bigger, in relative terms, uh, uh, four or five times bigger than in control cases. So those are cases of African or European descent, and those are the four. Yeah, they have a much larger uh, uh, septum. Now, uh, you, many of you guys have probably not done uh, so much comparative um, uh, um, uh, neuroscience uh, to, to estimate this. Uh, uh, a four or five difference, uh, size difference in a brain structure. That's quite something. Uh, let's briefly uh, look at this. Yeah, here we compare human brains to chimpanzee brains to macaque brains. And basically, if you look at the relative size of brain structures, uh, the cerebellum, the, the diencephalon, the bulbus, uh, uh, the septum, etc. In humans, only the cortex is larger and all the other brain parts are slightly smaller. Yeah, that, that's how it looks. Now, if we briefly compare the septum of the fora to these, uh, you get this picture. It's by far the only structure that is four or five times uh, larger in, in a human tribe. Uh, uh, and the difference, it eclipses any of the relative brain size differences that we see be between macaques or chimps and us, yeah? Now the four, they are very close to us. They may be separated 50,000 years ago, yeah? So what it makes us think is there has been a very strong evolutionary drive, a very strong change uh, to this brain structure. And obviously, again, what um, we wonder about uh, uh, is uh, that, um, uh, this, uh, uh, that the lateral septum here, because of the cannibalistic behaviors they practice, uh, needed to mediate uh, an anti-cannibalistic uh, kin protection. And uh, what I think is, if, if you look at the neurobiology of cannibalism, it doesn't look like an unsolvable problem. Yeah? First of all, we have a strong theory about it, that you shouldn't eat kin. Yeah, there's kin selection theory. 
Then we have uh, kin avoidance behavior in cannibalistic animals, the spitting out, avoiding to eat kin. We have the lateral septum that seems to mediate kinship in, in rats. And uh, we have an enlarged uh, lateral septum in cannibalistic tadpoles. We also have a lot of similar finding in humans. Yeah, humans also avoid kin. They also uh, uh, vomit when they eat, uh, 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 engage in beha cannibalistic behaviors. We see kin responses in human imaging, and uh, we see a strongly enlarged uh, uh, lateral septum in uh, in the in the fore. Uh, sort of the the one cannibalistic tribe uh, is the best documented cannibalistic behavior. And the, the change we get there is absolutely dramatic. It's the biggest change in uh, of relative brain structures, relative size of a brain structure that we've seen in uh, uh, primate evolution. So a, a very striking finding. Let me wrap up here. Um, I, I talked about kinship. I think it's underrated in neuroscience. I think uh, we make this very strong bonds to our to our family, and uh, it would be worth looking more if you want to understand how 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 bonds, social bonds, are formed. Uh, I think uh, it would be wise to look more at family structures and not ignore this. We think in rats, it's pretty clear that the lateral septum uh, mediates uh, kinship. Uh, we think the way it does that is that it, by having an ordered representation of responses uh, to non-kin dorsally and to uh, kin uh, ventrally. Finally, cannibalistic animals and humans show a uh, strong avoidance of kin, uh, kin avoidance and a traumatic increase of the lateral septum, uh, uh, sort of uh, tying uh, this uh, to kinship behavior and um, the inclusive fitness theory. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Michael. And uh, if someone had told me I was going to be hearing a talk that ranged from Hamilton to Hannibal, I don't think I could have predicted all the new things that I, uh, I learned. Um, I, I have a question to start us off, but other people please um, join in. Uh, it's that in the case where the cannibalism uh, drops during um, nesting behavior, so does the lateral septum show, uh, you know, receptors for steroids? Uh, I, I don't know. We haven't looked at this study that I uh, sounded. What was interesting about this study is they looked at many brain structures with immediate early gene activity. And there was one structure that showed uh, the pattern most strikingly, uh, and it was the lateral septum that had this very specific peak uh, during uh, when, when, the, when the little fish hatch, uh, it's somehow very strongly upregulated. And this is when you do not, when the animals drop all cannibalistic behaviors. Uh, normally, they are always very heavily cannibalistic. Uh, Many brain structures obviously show uh, changes in immediate early gene activity as a function of nesting behavior and whatsoever. What was interesting there about the lateral septum is it showed very strong changes and uh, uh, sort of changes exactly how you would have predicted it. Yeah. Um, what I have to say is uh, the homologies are, are not quite as easy and as clear. The, the tadpole uh, lateral septum, if you look at a couple of uh, connect, uh, at connectivity and atlases, it's very clear that it's exactly the same. I think uh, in the stickleback, uh, the, the ventral pallium is really homologous to the lateral septum. It's what the fish people say, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit less clear, yeah. yeah. So I, I have a question about uh, the exact role of the lateral septum in this, you know, by the way, fascinating talk. I, it was a little hard to, to listen to it actually because of the topic. <laughs> you know, for those of us that have not spoken and heard about cannibalism very often, you know, there's something visceral about it. Fascinating, utterly fascinating. I, I, must, I, must, I must congratulate you, Michael. Really, really wonderful. But anyway, so, you know, there's some evidence that the lateral septum is involved in social memory. And yep. I'm wondering how do you disentangle sort of social memory in general versus 
this kinship memory or this kinship you know behavior that may be you know central for the biology of cannibalism yeah Okay, uh, here, I don't think you can disentangle it. It's a bit like uh, my young's uh, familiarity versus kinship question. Uh, exactly. Look closely at the evidence. Uh, the way it looks like is uh, in the vertebrates, um, initially people thought maybe it's something innate. They have some innate knowledge of it, uh, but it's probably not, probably the way we make these kinship bonds is that we learn them in early life. Like the baby already learns the voice of the mother in the womb. Uh, um, now, what is uh, certainly very interesting is it's very polysensory. Uh, so you also find responses to calls there. We haven't checked uh, yet uh, because a lot of the, in rats, a lot of the behaviors are olfactory, uh, the kinship behaviors. Now I should say in primates, it's not like this. Uh, in primates, uh, I would expect if you do this in the human uh, septum, you it will also be tied to a, a social uh, memory. I think it's something learned, but what I would bet is you'll find uh, cells that respond to the voice of the mother, uh, because this is, seems to be something that the baby already learns in the womb or so. And uh, what is very stunning in, in a lot of the auditory research, uh, people do playback experiments and in primates, the type of call that you play back has an effect. If it's an alarm call, the monkeys look up, uh, or if it's, uh, if it's a, a, a just a normal communication, hello call, they react less to it. What is totally stunning is uh, if you look at the uh, the kin effects in this, yeah. Uh, namely, if it's, it's the sound of the sister, if it's an alarm call from the sister, the monkeys totally freak out. Yeah, they react totally different. Uh, it's at least as important as what they are saying, na namely, uh, if it's from kin or not. And I think this is all social memory. I, I don't think this can be uh, differentiated. What I think is potentially very interesting is that the synapses uh, in the lateral septum seem to be quite special. Uh, for example, you have their cells that have um, something that you find in no, uh, pretty much nowhere else in the brain or only very rarely at other places. You have uh, a lot of the cells have, um, as, uh, as there's a class of cells that has spines on the soma. It's something th that usually you do not find. Most of the, uh, uh, neurons in the nervous system have no spines on the soma. Yeah, uh, There you have a population of cells that gets this very unusual uh, excitatory input onto the soma. It's a different type of synapse. Yeah, And I would bet that these very strong bonds are a different type of uh, social memory. So I would not see it as opposed to it. Then uh, the visceral feelings, this is very much true. When you read these reports about these cannibalistic behaviors, uh, you have this feeling that you need to throw up. Uh, and uh, 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 it makes me think that we have mechanisms about this in us, yeah? If you read the anthropology literature, uh, the anthropologist says, oh, you can't really talk about this because you feel so strongly about it. I think there is something to the biology of, uh, of uh, cannibalism, that we have something about this in our brain, uh, because I react so strongly to uh, when you read these papers and you you feel oh now I need to throw up. Uh, it makes me feel uh, that there is um, special specific mechanisms for this in the brain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, can may I ask a question, Stephanie? So. Michael, you started off by making the point that when you showed us a picture of your family, most of us don't have an emotional attachment to that, those images. There's a human neurological syndrome, as you're probably aware, um, Capgras syndrome, in which basically people don't have an emotional attachment to their own family because they believe those people are imposters. So they've lost the emotional attachment to their own family. Um, is it known if the brain areas related to um, Capgras involve the lateral septum? Uh, no, I have no clue. I have no clue. It's, a, it's an interesting point. Uh, I, I should uh, check this. Uh, no, no, I think it's, it's it, it, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. The, what is a bit weird uh, is 
um, you you don't find all that much um, uh, uh, lesion effects or so. Uh, it's it's hard to come by. I think it's not a very common lesion, the the, the septum, but it's not that it never happens. Uh, it's uh, there are a couple of conditions where they actually pff, they rupture it because it uh, it uh, it uh, it's uh, in the way or so. And um, uh, uh, but but what then there then there are a couple of memory deficits uh, mentioned in these people. Uh, but uh, nothing very striking. Yeah? If you look at the human literature, it's, um, you wouldn't be so convinced. But my thinking is that uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe they don't uh, check this very carefully. Maybe uh, it's something you need to ask the relatives. Uh, so, did did, yeah, did yeah. this guy change? Uh, uh, maybe it's definitely not something uh, after septal lesions. Um, yes. So in in Copgrass, one of the theories is that there's a disconnect between visual processing and one of the emotional centers. So it might not be a lesion to the lateral septum, but communication yeah. between different areas. So that's generally seen as one of the major theories behind Copgrass. Interesting. No, I, I, I'm, okay, I'm, thank not you. Thank you. I'm not aware of it. So there are a couple of things. Occasionally, people described very interesting things like um, uh, uh, it's involved in multiple things, uh, and uh, there seems to be also something about uh, sexual orientation, uh, 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 sexual preference. Uh, you can have effects uh, from uh, from lateral septum lesions on that, um, but uh, generally, uh, uh, the, the the effects that people report there's most of all there's not much. Uh, oh, I haven't read anything about the family, uh, and I looked at the lesion literature. Another uh, syndrome, kind of the flip side of that, um, might be Williams syndrome, where uh, you know the the kids actually sort of trust everybody, right? As if everybody is their kin. Um, I see um, Ishvan. We have a question for you from yeah. you, and then there's a couple in the chat that I'll okay. do after you, Ishvan. Yes. Hi, Mikael. It's Ishvan Modi here. Good to see you, and thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering whether um, the GABAergic phenotype of these lateral septal neurons, which is the predominant phenotype of those cells, is it possible that it might change with the enlargement in some of these uh, either cannibalistic or, you know, kin uh, sort of related uh, yeah, issues? Yeah. Here, uh, we haven't looked in any depths uh, at that. Yeah, so uh, we tried to get uh, um, we got these tadpoles from David Fennig. Yeah, he was kind enough to give them to us, uh, uh, but we haven't uh, studied them in more detail. We know, just know it's twice as large. Generally, the thinking is exactly as you say. Cellularly, it looks a lot like the striatum. It's almost exclusively totally. in the yeah. neurons. So uh, I, I yeah. don't know if there is a change of transmitter um, um, there's, there's also a relationship between uh, the activity of these neurons and speed during theta, for instance. And I was wondering whether you recorded any theta in, the, in these animals and found any changes. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's this very strong uh, theta effects from uh, the medial septum, which we try uh, yeah, to stay course. away from. But uh, uh, we, we also saw, uh, we looked a little bit at the activity, but nothing uh, particularly stunning. Now, okay. uh, one, thing, one input that I think is probably also very, very relevant there uh, is um, uh, to social learning and social memory uh, is uh, uh, there is a prominent uh, opioid encephalinergic uh, input uh, there. Yeah, mm -hmm. very prominent. Uh, and uh, um, there is a lot of reason to think that a social attachment has something to do with opioids. Yeah, like the first day you bring your kid to daycare, uh, it's the worst day of its life. Yeah, the the, the kids they just uh, 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 do not stop crying. Yeah, and uh, uh, the the reason is probably a kind of opioid withdrawal syndrome. So. Uh, mm. uh, if you if you separate uh, red pups from their mother, they would also do isolation calls like hell. 
Very yeah. low doses of opioids help big time. And we wonder okay. if these opioids are arriving there and if they're involved in social learning. For example, uh, little lambs, they learn their mother. They, they are born and they don't know what their mother is. But in the first day, they learn it. You can block this by interfering with uh, the, uh, the, this learning of the mother. You can block this with interfering with, uh, uh, op with the opioid system. Yeah, if you give them- Fascinating, thank, uh, thank so, you, Mikael. Okay, uh, we have a question about the sticklebacks and tadpoles that are spitting out their kin. And yeah. um, the question is, do you think it's based on their being able to recognize a chemical in the taste or do yeah. you think that they have um, actually individual recognition and and know that that's their kin? Yeah, so so uh, that's how the biologists label this. Uh, they are both in the sticklebacks and in the tadpoles. They say it's tasting behavior, or in the sticklebacks they call it testing behavior. So what happens is the stickleback he, he swallows a little uh, fish, yeah, and then he thinks a little bit about it and spits it out. And people thought it's gustatory tasting, but this is almost certainly the wrong interpretation. Why? If you occlude, if you occlude the nares in the in the tadpoles, uh, they randomly eat kin and non-kin. Yeah, they it's they need the olfaction, and they can almost certainly not taste it. At least in humans, we know that. Uh, some of these cannibals that I was talking about, they had little butcheries, yeah? They sold the meat and there were no customer complaints, yeah? People happily eat, uh, eat human meat if you uh, tell them it's veal, yeah? Uh, so uh, they have no problem with it. Uh, it's uh, the reason they vomit, I think is the idea. The idea of eating uh, uh, conspecific is disgusting, yeah? And uh, I think it comes from the brain, not from the taste. Yeah, that's my take, um, because there's absolutely no evidence, neither in animals nor in humans, that we can taste uh, what is a conspecific. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Um, is yeah. that um, just because I understand that with humans, that makes sense because they can recognize the kinship. But my confusion is just that like in fish that don't have that cortical, like, um, complexity, how do they recognize the kinship if they're not, if it's not a chemical or if it's not like a taste thing? That's like, that's why I'm confused about the differentiation. Um, so I think they have inborn concepts of, first of all, what is, uh, uh, what is, how, how, how does, do the fish do it? My thinking is uh, the, the sticklebacks, they usually eat uh, other fish, yeah, and they, they, they eat uh, different species, they eat that faster, but they also feed on, on conspecifics. Now, the one time they don't eat the conspecifics and they, is when they have a newly hatched, uh, when they're fish hatched, somehow this skin eating, this, uh, this predatory behavior is there's a break on it, yeah? And obviously I wonder if this break on uh, the do not eat, uh, do not eat there comes from this upregulation uh, of the lateral septum activity, but we don't know that. What we know is there are heavy inputs from the uh, lateral septum to the lateral hypothalamus, which controls feeding. Yeah, I, I briefly mentioned that in the beginning from the deep layers of the lateral septum, which we think represent kin, there are inputs to the lateral hypothalamus where um, eatability is sort of represented. Uh, things, oh, these are tasty things, they give strong responses. Non-tasty things, uh, bitter things, they give also strong responses in the lateral uh, hypothalamus. And that would be my intuition uh, how they do it. So uh, the fish, I think uh, they, they have a timing thing. Um, in uh, tadpoles, um, they somehow learn um, um, the, I think they, 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 they grow up at a place and they, they somehow early in life uh, take uh, close tadpoles as kin. Yeah? Uh, uh, it's, it's not entirely clear, but it's clear that you can um, uh, train them. Uh, for example, if you make them all smell alike, uh, they, uh, they are more likely uh, to treat them as kin or 
uh, stuff like that. It seems to be also early um, early learning. Yeah, uh, that is uh, probably in many vertebrates uh, mechanisms. Uh, uh, learning around birds, around hatching, uh, uh, you sort of uh, uh, tech uh, who's around you as family. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, um, we're getting lots of comments in the chat that it was a, a, a fascinating talk and um, some people have more questions and I just wanted to say that can they email you later on because absolutely, I know absolutely. I'd be more than happy to uh, respond to that. Yeah, right. Because it's um, it's getting kind of late there and I know you have one last uh, um, appointment today. So uh, just going to um, have us end now and thank you so much for uh, such a new and interesting area. And I look forward to maybe seeing you in Woods Hole in person this year. Okay. Yeah, Thank pleasure, you. pleasure, folks. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Bye. Awesome talk.